Is your data secure? Sadly, the answer for most people at the moment is no. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, our solution to this, which is called Pergos. Uh, the name Pergos comes from the Greek word Pergos, which means a safe place, a stronghold, or a tower. But let me start off with what I'm actually looking for. I'd like to be able to store my files online, but without Dropbox being able to read them. Pretty much all major stor uh, cloud storage providers are able to read your files, and they apply their own arbitrary policies on whether or not they even allow you to access your own files, let alone share them. I'd like to be able to selectively share my photos, but without Facebook seeing them. And I'd like to store my files somewhere online, but not in a company that could go bankrupt. In a little bit more detail, there's three large categories of what we're trying to, trying to achieve here. First one is security, the second one is control, and the third is convenience. So under security, we, we want a, a safe login, and there's a bit of a question of what does that even mean in a decentralized system. We need strong cryptography, ideally post-quantum. Uh, we, we'd like to hide file metadata, so file names, file sizes, even the uh, directory structure itself. Uh, and we'd like to be independent of the SSL certificate authorities and free of DNS itself. And in terms of control, uh, it should be self-hostable, because ultimately, if someone else's machine is storing your data and they turn off that machine, you no longer have your data. Uh, I want fine-grained access control, so I can share individual things with individual people or groups or whatever. Um, I want my contact list to be private. No one but me should know that. And I'd like it to be pseudonymous, so there's no requirement for, say, a phone number or even an email address uh, to sign up. And possibly the most critical one is convenience, certainly if you want anyone to actually use it. Uh, so it should have a web interface. Uh, you should be able to log in from any device. Uh, standard uh, file sharing things like file syncing, being able to publish files. Essentially, it should be as convenient as Dropbox or Facebook. So let's start off with control. So the, over, the overall architecture we have, uh, almost all the data is in IPFS itself. We have a very simple logical view of that. It's, it's a content address data store, so it's a mapping from hash to data. Uh, for mutable pointers, we have IPNS, which is a mapping from public key to a hash, fundamentally. Uh, we have a, a, a public key infrastructure as well, but that, um, that stores its data in IPFS and IPNS it, it's the, itself. The only data we have which is not in IPFS itself uh, is uh, the follow request, which is the mechanism we use to implement the social side of things. And so the idea is that any Pergos client can talk to any Pergos server. They don't actually have to trust the server. Um, and it works. You, it could be, you could be running on local hosts. It could be our public server or, or anything. So the basic structure is we have, a, it's a global file system. So each user gets some space under their username in the, in the top level. Um, each user has a, a tree of symmetric keys with cryptographic links between them. The, the, this is stored in a structure called Cryptree, which I'll talk more about in a second. So you end up with uh, location plus a key gives you a cryptographic access token or a capability. And to grant someone read or indeed write access to a file or, or a, an entire subtree, uh, you just need to share this capability with them somehow. Uh, and there are various ways we, 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 we use that. We explicitly don't use convergent encryption uh, because that leaks what files you have. So everything is encrypted with a random key. Um, but yeah, so now let's, let's talk a bit more about this Cryptree data structure. So, at the top left, you can see that there's a directory. That directory has a subdirectory. And there's at least one file in that subdirectory. So the arrows on this diagram, these are the, the links in the crypt tree. Uh, and essentially, it's the target of the link is encrypted with the source. So all the boxes are keys, symmetric keys. And so given any key, I can follow all the arrows around this graph. So someone who has the base key for the top left directory, they can, first of all, read the name of the directory itself. 
They can also go down into the subdirectory, read its name, and then they can go down to the file and see the file's name and the file's contents. On the other hand, if someone who only has the, the top key in the file, so the file's parent key, they can read the file, obviously. It's metadata and it's data. But they can also follow these backlinks uh, through the parent keys. And what that does is that allows us to give uh, a well-defined path to all files, uh, which you, you obviously need that in a file system. So in the process of actually uploading a file, we first uh, split the file into five megabyte chunks. Each of those five meg chunks, up to five meg, obviously you can have files smaller than that, uh, is encrypted independently. Uh, and each of those is split into 40 fragments. Each of those fragments is then added into IPFS along with the encrypted metadata of that particular chunk, whether it's a directory or, well, so this, this is a file, but yeah. Directories don't, don't obviously don't have data. Uh, and so w what connects you to that data, so the file fragments, those are the, the 40 fragments from the previous slide. The cryptree node, that's the metadata for this particular chunk. And the cryptree nodes themselves uh, are stored in this other data structure called a CHAMP, which is a compressed hash array mapped try, which has a lot of very nice properties, um, mainly insertion order independence. Um, but essentially, it allows you to it's a key value store, so it's like, a bit like a B tree, um, but better. <laughs> so how does sharing work? Uh, users have a public boxing key, and to send a follow request, I create a directory in my space and send a capability to that directory to encrypt it to that friend's public key. Uh, and the, it's encrypted to that, but also encrypted from a, an arbitrary key, which I just generated just for that request. So, the network, themselves, the network itself can't see who's sending the request, only who it's being sent to. So we we go to some lengths to try and hide, as I say, the social graph as well. Uh, what this one consequence of this? Um, so this is all using Tweet and ACL. So that's Curve two five five one nine. Uh, is currently shared files would be vulnerable to a sufficiently large quantum computer, and we we care about this kind of thing. But so as soon as there is a a clear candidate algorithm, we're going to switch, switch to that. Currently, there isn't one. Now on to the next category, conv convenience. So decentralized login, what does that mean? The way we do this, we take your password, uh, we salt it with your username, we send it through uh, the, a memory hard hashing function called script, which is tuned to take about a second on a, a reasonable device. And the output of that gives you three things. You have your root symmetric key, which is what you use to decrypt your root directory. And you have two key pairs. One is your signing key pair, that's kind of your identity key pair. And the boxing key pair, which I've just mentioned, is used for follow requests. These are only ever stored in RAM and never written to disk or, or transmitted. Um, one cool thing we can do with capabilities, you can have a public link. So it looks something, uh, something like this. So you'll have the URL of the server, a hash, as in not a, not a cryptographic hash, the character a hash. And then there's three, three components. You have essentially the public key. Uh, this is a, a label. And finally, the actual decryption key. Uh, and various projects have used this technique. But the cool thing is the, the stuff after the hash is, is not actually sent over the network to the server. So as long as the JavaScript that's delivered to the page can interpret that, you haven't actually exposed the file to the network. So Maybe a better name than public link would be secret link, but the point is you don't need any software other than a web browser to read whatever this points to. Uh, and indeed, it, it can be uh, an individual file uh, or a folder. Now onto the, the final fun topic is security. Can a login be cracked? Fundamentally, you are only as secure as your password. So we, we recommend 14 character passwords. How, how many possibilities are there? With a random alphanumeric password, there's about 10 to the 25 possibilities. Uh, a GPU can calculate about a million script hashes a second uh, as measured by Litecoin users. We actually use harder parameters than Litecoin, so this is a, an underestimate, but that's fine. Uh, so yeah, one GPU then to crack a single user's login would take about 10 to the 19 seconds or 300 billion years. Uh, 
if you were to able to have 300 million GPUs all going at once, it would still take a thousand years. And the cost of those 300 million GPUs would be 300 billion US dollars approximately. Um, so suffice it to say, with, with, with a good enough password, it's essentially practically un uncrackable. Um, the proviso is this is very, uh, the difficulty is, is well, exponential or logarithmic, depending on your view. So if you were to use, say, an eight character password, that's eminently crackable, and that drops to something like $10,000 to crack in a year. So you really do need a decent length and quality password. What about quantum computer-based attacks? So I've already mentioned currently that shared files would be vulnerable to a, a large enough quantum computer. What about things you haven't shared? So as I've mentioned, to get from logging in to reading your files, the only things we're using are hashing through script and symmetric encryption. Neither of these have any known quantum computer attacks or not significant ones. You get a factor of two, but that's about it. Uh, compared to the logarithmic improvement you get with um, asymmetric crypto. And then the final comment is normally, but JavaScript crypto is insecure. Why, how can you do this? It depends on your threat model. So if you're a, a casual user, say, for example, you trust our public server, you trust the SSL certificate authority, you can just use our public website as you would use Facebook or Dropbox or whatever. If you're a more paranoid user, you can take our source, compile it with three different binaries, run it on some open hardware which you have, uh, and that's, that's great. And, but the point here is we, we can cater to a range of threat models. Uh, and the other point on security is, is the build security of, of our actual build process. Uh, we already have reproducible builds both on the server and the front end. Uh, we don't use NPM, we have only eight uh, JavaScript dependencies, all of which are vended. Uh, we have our own deterministic replacement for Webpack uh, and JavaScript minifiers. We self-host all the assets, because obviously if you're injecting something from a CDN or something, there's no guarantee what they're actually giving you, so that's a, that's a tr that would, would be a trivial backdoor. Uh, and the other point is most of the client code is actually written uh, in a type-safe language, Java, and we cross-compile that to JavaScript. So now I'm going to do a quick demo. So I'm just going to log in on this is on our public demo server. Um, and the first thing I want to show you is uh, streaming video. Um, So to do this, as you know, basically we have to reverse that process you saw earlier, which means we, we download the 40 fragments uh, in parallel, concatenate them together, decrypt it, and then pipe that locally to a, a video element in the browser. So nothing's, nothing's ever exposed to the network. I'm not sure if sound will work, but let's see what happens. Um, and we can do that with audio files or video files or whatever, whatever you like. Um, as another example, I'll take you through the sign-up process. So uh, one cool thing we do is, well, we w obviously need to guide people to create good passwords. Eventually, we'll have a way you can generate a password here. Uh, but for now, let's say if I were to put in password, uh, it tells us that's, that's the most common password. Uh, so we have a list of the 10,000 most common passwords, which, we, which is like 9K, it's nothing. Uh, so for example, I can try one, two, three. That's the fourth most common password. One, two, three, four is the... That's not there, okay, that's interesting. One, two, three, whoop. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five is the sixth most... Anyway, you get the idea. Um, so if I sign up this user and so there we go, that's, that's signed up. Let's sign up another one. Uh, 
we can go back to this user. So this is their, the, the global namespace. And so this is our space here inside Q. That's our username. Uh, let's create a directory. There we go. And let's go back to this guy. So now the, the social side of things, I can send uh, a follow request to the other, to someone else, but in this case, Q. Coolio. And if I go back to Q, then we have a follow request that's shown up. We, can, we have three options. You can allow and follow back. You can just allow or you can deny. Um, let's allow and follow back. Cool. And going back to W, uh, we can see, yep, we're both following and being followed by Q. So go back to Q. Go into this directory. Let's uh, let's upload a file. Here we go. So we can basically say, let's share this with the other user, W. And now, if we go back to W, and so now we've we've. A, Friends with Guku, we can see that file. We can open it in the browser if we want or download it. And there we go. Um, and I can show you also the public links thing. So back to the other user on the real server. If, um, if I go up a directory, let's go up two directories. So this one here, is, so I've got to create a public link to this directory. And if I now open that in another page here, so you can see there that's got all the capability in the URL. Um, and if the network behaves, then cool, cool, okay. So we can see we've gone straight to that directory which we shared, media. Uh, if we go up a directory, we don't see anything else, even though there were plenty of siblings to, to the media directory. Um, and uh, as you'd expect, we can go into uh, any, any one of these and, um, and, and view what's in there. So you, you get the entire subtree from that. So this, you could share an image gallery like this, for example. Um, there we go. Um, so now let's carry on with the talk. So yeah, current status, you've just seen a web interface. We also have a Fuse client, so you can mount it, uh, mount it locally. Uh, we, we still need to integrate it with Tor, though that's largely on the IPFS side. Um, need, we still need a security audit. Um, so yeah, if you go to peergos.org, you can see when, or sign up to hear when our alpha is ready, which will hopefully be soon. We've got a small little booklet you can read. Uh, or you can try out our demo on demo.peergos.net. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Any, any questions?